Hi Part 2's is Friday, March the 11th, and we start Module 4, which is Sacraments. So let's let's add up the equation here. We looked at, in Module 3, we looked at morality and ethics. We really focused on the image of God and the dignity of human life as a, as a central component of who we are as Catholic Christians. And that should identify us, that should help us in our worldview, how we see ourselves, how we see others, how we interact, and how we create a better uh, place for all of us in this kingdom of God on earth. Adding in the next, uh, our next module, we have a sacramental uh, identity part of how we see the world and how we act and how we you know develop our Christian identity is through the sacraments right it takes us through our lives so in part one you looked at sacraments of initiation part three we look at sacraments of vocation part two we're going to look at sacraments of healing and I'm going to go into greater depth uh, in terms of that um, shortly okay so we need to see that you know um, these are important um, experiences for us this is how we grow okay and some of these sacraments it's a one-shot deal some of them we could do multiple times but they are important in terms of who we are part of our relationship with God and part of our relationship as a church okay so we need to really take a look at that um, topic two is ecological healing. Uh, we're looking at care for our home, our earth. Uh, very early in the papacy, for, uh, um, Pope Francis uh, wrote the encyclical Laudato Si, care for our home. Um, you know, the church is always trying to be a voice out there, even in its own brokenness. It's trying to recognize places that we need to heal. And as being co-creators with God, are we doing a good job with our earth? We're not. How do we heal this? It almost seems impossible, but we got to make different decisions. we got to look at the earth with its sacredness. we got to look at ourselves as less, you know, less selfish, you know. And, and how, we part of, how are we part of this healing process? How are we going to reconcile with what we've done to the earth? And, and, and what can we do to move it into the future to make it better, stronger, and keep the sacredness of what it was meant to be for us, a place, our home, okay? Uh, sacraments of healing, I'll talk about that in a moment, but the next topic four is brokenness within the church. Church has always been broken because it's human beings, but the degree of brokenness in this time in history is really severe because we're feeling the impact of that through the sexual abuse, through the residential schools, through the things that our modern church is trying to deal with, right? And we need to stand by our church too. I know it's hard. A lot of us have walked away. A lot of us have walked away, but kind of thinking, do I come back? We're not sure how to come back, right? It's a work in progress, right? I had this book on my bookshelf when a Pope asked forgiveness. You know, we're, we're, we're all human beings and we're all making mistakes. And I'm not trying to say, you know, oh, okay, you know, let's all hold hands and make this better. No, 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 no. We need to own up to it. We need to deal with it. We need to heal and we need to help the people that have been hurt by it. But also we have to see the benefits of what the church gives us as well, that we just don't throw it away, that there's a lot of good in it. And there's a lot that we can, you know, still salvage and raise up. You know, the death and resurrection, even the church, parts of the church has to die in order for it to become better. OK, so we just don't say, OK, it's over and walk away. How are we going to be part of that process of healing and making the church better? You know, we may not see it in our lifetime, but we're called in this time in history to help heal and move this church forward to being better, stronger and again, part of the the world view of so many people that belong to this church okay um grief and loss uh is the last topic and i'll address that at the end too so let's look at the sacraments of healing first okay i want to drive home the fact that a lot of people don't understand our sacraments okay and i 
I can go through all of them. I could spend a lot of time trying to explain it, but let me focus on what we're dealing with here. Sacraments of healing. So the sacrament of reconciliation is one of those that we're afraid to enter into for many reasons. Number one, as young kids, you know, we're like, oh, the black box, being afraid of the dark, so, you know, the voice behind the screen, right? And, and most of all, it's owning up to our brokenness. We're, we're it's, it's embarrassing. I don't want to tell the priest, you know, what I've been thinking and doing and the things I've done wrong. And you don't want to own up to that stuff. It's hard. But we got to do that. It's part of becoming better people, right? Oh, I can say sorry to God anytime. You better. <laughs> we got to say sorry to God every day because we're messing up every day. Every day we're doing something to hurt ourselves or hurt someone else or to hurt God, right? But sacraments give us that 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 the grace the courage the strength and it doesn't happen right away like we kind of go into the box almost like an atm machine and like where's my uh receipt where's my uh where's the cash kind of thing right like we're instant gratification where's my grace come on i did a deposit now i want my grace and my strength and my courage it doesn't work that way. It's over time. It builds up. Forgiveness is work, right? You may not feel it the first time you go in there. You might feel it the, you know, the hundredth time you go in there. I don't know. I don't know what your journey's like, right? And, you know, we may not have had good experiences with confession or reconciliation. Try again. Not every priest is cut out for every aspect of ministry. Some might not be great confessors. Some might be, you know, not great homilists. Some might not be great in schools. Some might not be great administrators. You're getting my drift here? There's so much they have to be great at, and they can't be great at everything. So find one that works for you. I mean, even the Pope has a confessor, right? And that becomes a relationship, a journey, a, a way of growing. We'll pay like hundreds of dollars to see a, a psychiatrist or a counselor all the time. It becomes a relationship. It becomes a journey, right? Even the psychological uh, psych um, psychological world. Um, let's take this out of the sacred, put it into secular. I remember hearing a report that uh, psychologists said that one of the healthiest aspects of the Catholic Church is the sacrament of reconciliation. That you can go into another person and that is sacred. That whatever you say can never be taken out of that out of that room or out of that experience. And you can unload the garbage you've been carrying. And another human voice will say, you are healed. Psychologically, that is incredibly healing. And then let's add the sacramental part and get the grace and the courage and the strength from God. Wow. It's pretty powerful. When we do the Salesian retreat, it's a leadership, three-day leadership retreat with kids. And before we send them off as leaders at the end, we take them in the, in the middle of the retreat. And we, we go to uh, this experience of reconciliation. We prepare them for the sacrament. We bring priests in. A lot of these kids have not had this sacrament since their first time. And so we prepare them. And when I ran the retreat, I always said, this is garbage day. We're taking out the trash. And I'd hold a garbage can. Right? And then these kids, we prepare them, they go and, and experience this sacrament with a really great priest that we bring. And they, some of them stay in there like a long time, like 20 minutes or, you know, they're, they're, they're unloading. There's a lot of garbage to be taken out. But when it's done and we, you know, we all meet in the games room later because those who go first, and sometimes you have to wait a couple hours before, before the last person's done. So they, they go, they release some energy, they play ping pong, we order some pizza, kind of just to kind of deal with everyone coming out of this experience. And they're like two feet off the ground. They're flying. They're feeling light. They're feeling great. Oh my goodness. Isn't that amazing? Don't we want to feel like that? Don't we want to feel like all the garbage inside of us has been taken out? That we're, that we're walking on air? That we feel lighter? This is what we want. This is what the church is offering us. For free. Right? Come on in anytime. Sacrament of uh, uh, healing. Uh, the sacrament of the sick. Oh, hold on. Before I do that, um, reconciliation, I always say it's a selfish thing because it's about you, right? The person you're having an issue with might not even realize 
how much they've hurt you. Or they might not even be ready to come into reconciliation. They may, might not be ready to enter into some sort of dialogue or, or journey of trying to repair that relationship. And so what are you going to do? Keep carrying that burden until they're ready? You're going to keep being angry? You're going to keep feeling the weight of that brokenness and waiting for that person to come around? Or are you going to heal and lift yourself up and get rid of the garbage and be two feet off the ground? Right? It's not easy. It takes a lot of work. I always use the example of my father. My father, uh, when I was uh, young, I was daddy's little girl. But then when I became an adult woman, I realized how his alcoholism was killing our family. And I, I confronted him with it. He didn't see it. I don't think he even saw himself as an alcoholic. It was so painful. But I had to decide at that moment, do I want a relationship with my father or don't I? And so I decided I still did, despite his brokenness, despite the pain he was causing our family. And so I entered on a journey of forgiveness by myself. I'm still on this journey. He died about 15 years ago. And when I was at the hospital, I knew he was going, and I couldn't say the words that I loved him. They got stuck in my throat, and that was hard. This is where faith is so important because I knew when he died, he was with God. And God told him that I loved him. And he knew, even though the words couldn't come out from me. It's hard. Being human is hard. Being in relationships is so hard and painful. But faith helps. God helps. Our sacramental experiences help. Why don't we want to take up that offer of being helped? I don't know. Sacrament of uh, the sick used to be called extreme unction. We used to think, oh, the priest is at the door, it's over, and it's not. Now we look at the sacrament differently. We could use it many times in our lives. It could be when we're feeling issues with mental health, or when we're going in for an operation, or we're just not feeling well. We can, we can ask for this sacrament. It's about healing. It's about helping us get over that hurdle and not feeling alone, and again, asking for God's grace, strength, the last topic is grief and loss, and this is such a hard one because we don't feel comfortable with this. I've been trained with the bereaved families of Canada. I have done so many, uh, uh, I've had so many experience of doing uh, bereavement in school communities after students have died or staff members, and I still feel sometimes I don't know what the right words are. I don't think we ever really do know. But what is important is that we offer our presence and our prayers. And when, you know, we don't try to comfort people with, with phrases like, oh, when God closes a, uh, a door, he opens a window. No, no, people want that door open. They don't want that window. So that's not really comforting. What's comforting is, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm going to pray for you. Is there anything I can do for you? And then if you're really close to that person, it's just being there silently next to them. And when they're ready to talk, they're going to talk. They're going to feel your presence. And even with your students, maybe just sitting with your students quietly. And just they know that someone's next to them, that's supporting them. And when they're ready, they're going to talk. And to recognize grief doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't get processed within two to three weeks or four to five days as we get uh, for bereavement days. It might take months, it might take years, it might be go, you know, underground for a while, and then something will happen and trigger grief from something that happened years ago, or it might just come out as anger. I know my nephews, when my brother-in-law died about four years ago, they were, you know, in their late 20s, and I know they haven't grieved. I see it in their anger, but I recognize it. I I. I recognize that anger sometimes is, is, it stems from this grief that has not been dealt with. And I have to be patient and loving with them. Oh, it's a lot of work to be human. It's a lot of work to be in relationship. It's a lot of work to be whole and healthy. 
but we need to do it because we're worth it. Others in our lives that we love, they're worth it and God's worth it. Let's pray. And the reading for today is incredible. It's right on. And so as we pray, let's pray for healing and peace for the Ukraine and for uh, Russia, that, that we as human beings can stop resorting to war, and that we can try to resolve our differences with peace. And I know probably you're dealing with, you know, issues in your own classroom with students that maybe have family, and just let them know that you're there and that you're praying for them. In the name the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And this gospel is from Matthew. Jesus went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he taught them. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, that's easy to do, right? You will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while the two of you are on your way to court. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow, hey, eh? There's a lot in that reading. But it just comes down to what I was saying, you know? Like, what's your role in this? What, what did you do? How can you try to mend this and not just sit there and say, oh, you've hurt me. You're at fault. Right? This, this is what the gospel is saying, right? What's your part in the brokenness? Right? And if you don't deal with it, if you don't want to be healed, if you don't take what's offered for you to be healed, then you're throwing yourself into prison. You're being held hostage by your own anger. We don't want that. We want to heal. We want to feel like we're two feet off the ground. We want to get rid of the garbage. It's garbage day. Are you going to take advantage of that? Are you going to take advantage of, of what the church offers us, even in its own brokenness? It's offering us healing and God's grace. God bless.